Hi, this is Pastor Michael Foster of the historical First African Baptist Church here in Tuscaloosa, Alabama. We're better known as the Fab Church. I'm praying that you enjoy this sermon that you're about to hear. I pray that it'll be life-forming and life-changing, and that it will meet you just where you are. My prayer is that the Lord will just touch you, and prayerfully this sermon will help lift your spirits and get you to the next level where the Lord will have you. God bless you, and enjoy. So we're, we're still going to continue in this whole series about affliction. And I don't want us to miss, amen, not one Sunday of this series, and it's happened so many people, even across the state and some other places, and you get a few emails and calls about, I did not know that about affliction. I, I did not know that the Lord has a way of afflicting us. And one, one, one of my cousins called me and she was saying something about, um, I've got to be careful now to be so connected to the Lord by way of the Holy Spirit that I don't call what the Lord is doing, the devil is doing it. And that's important because sometimes just because you uh, nailing a nail and hit your finger don't mean the devil had anything to do with it now. Just mean you were careless. <laughs> don't give the devil credit for something that he don't deserve. My, my youngest daughter had a little mishap, and she was saying, "I ring the devil just no, mm -mm. don't give him no credit. You just have to be careful. Don't give the devil no credit. Don't give the devil no credit. Y'all don't don't give him no credit." <laughs> Amen. Because according to Paul, the Lord wants us to know that all things work together for the good of those that love the Lord and be called according to his purpose. Okay? So even when it looks bad, it ain't bad. Amen. Amen. And I can only give you the only illustration about that is when we were little. My mother used to give us something called cash flow. You got to live below Montgomery to know what I'm talking about. That's a little, that's a little south of here. Y'all ain't, ain't used to that. And it never tasted good. But whatever that was ailing you, <laughs> it seemed to take care of it. And so such as it is with the Lord. Whatever we're in the vineyard for the Lord, everything we do for the Lord don't feel good, don't taste good, don't seem good but it's going to work together for our good if we just keep trusting the Lord. Amen. So today I want you to look at verse, uh, so continuing Psalms 119, verse number 71. Then we're going to scamper on down to verse 81. Uh, 71 sets the tone, the tenor, sets the tremble for what we're talking about today. When you read uh, 119, verse number 71, you'll find these old, and familiar and strange words. Old, familiar, and strange to some of us as we stand to receive the word of the Lord. Those of you who have your Bibles or devices, you can look on with us, and if you don't have any of those, look on the screen, the screen and listen to what David has been described as the author of this text. But watch what David said. This is going to blow some of our minds. It is good for me that I have been afflicted. <laughs> Let me say that one more time. David said, it was good for me. It is good for me that I have been afflicted that I might learn thy statutes. Let me give you an MAF translation. It was good that the Lord whipped my behind to get me back where he wanted me to be. Amen. Let's go to verse 81 real quickly. Verse 81 says it real quickly here. It says, my soul fainteth for thy salvation, but I hope in thy word. He says, not just his person, but his soul. My eyes fail for thy word, saying, when wilt thou comfort me? For I am become like a bottle. You got another translation. It says a wine skin in the smoke. Yet do I not forget thy statues. How many are they 
How many are the days of the servant? When wilt thou execute judgment on them that persecute me? That's the question he's asking. The proud have big pits for me, which are not after the law. All thy commandments are faithful. They persecute me wrongfully. Help thy me. One translation says, has two words, help me. Verse 87 says, they had almost consumed me upon earth. Don't, don't be, they, had, they had almost got rid of me here on earth. But, but the key words underline this, they almost did. What kept you, David? The affliction of the Lord. <laughs> the affliction of what the enemy tried to do. Because it made me run back to the Lord's word. Amen. Lord, have mercy. Amen. They almost consumed me upon earth. Then they got that consecrated conjunction. But I forsook not thy precept. That's his word. Verse 88, and I ain't have this on my text, but I'm going to read it now. Quicken me after thy loving kindness. So shall I keep the testimony of thy mouth. That's enough. You may be seated. I want to talk and continue to talk in this sermon series from the subject of the discernment of affliction. The discernment of affliction. Beloved, I think I need to say first and foremost, there are some things you can only determine, discover, and discern and that can only be done in the middle of affliction. There are some things that you won't ever pick up on. There are some people that you don't know are not good for you until sometimes you discern it through how they react and respond and through what happens as a consequence of you being connected to God. Sometimes God's word is not enough for you to understand what God is doing. So therefore the Lord sends affliction to help you understand what the Lord is saying to you. Sometimes affliction is the car mess up. Sometimes affliction is the air condition go out when it's 90 plus degrees. Sometimes affliction is simply that Things around you start to tear up. But in fact, and, but the fact that the matter is, in spite of all that happens around us, this is the Lord's way of getting our attention when his word couldn't get our attention. David discernment in verse 71, something you probably wouldn't hear from the mouths of any Christian. David says it very simply and plainly. And unapologetically, David says, it was good for me that I was afflicted. You could only say that when you've been through some stuff. But not just when you've been through some stuff. You could only say that when you come out on the other side of what you've been through. That you can say, it was good for me that I was afflicted. Most of us, if we are afflicted or if we are in the middle of being afflicted, we cannot say it's good for me that I was afflicted. Because we can't say and speak to the goodness of God sometimes in the middle of affliction, but when we come out on the other side and we see the purpose behind what God was trying to teach us, then we can say it was good for me that the Lord got me back on track. Beloved, you don't, don't sit and act as if I, 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 that, that it was something wrong with the Lord getting you back on track. Because no one has to say this morning because I'm going to tell you for them, all of us at one point in time has been on the wrong track. All of us in our life filled with driving have went across the line every once in a while. Hmm. All of us have not colored inside the lines and and because we have not, we, we, nobody or nothing could get us back in line 
like the God we serve afflicting us. So here we are today. David said it helped him keep the Lord's statute. Affliction don't make you or break you. Affliction just defines who you really are in Christ. Let me say that one more time because I think we missed that. See, God does not send affliction to break us or make us who we are. God sends affliction to, affliction is just designed to show us who we really are in Christ Jesus. It's not for nobody else to discern. It's for you to evaluate where you are in Christ so that you can say to yourself, I need to do better. I want to warn you today, when you go through affliction, listen to me, keep the receipt so you don't have to go through it again. When you go through affliction, when God teaches us some stuff, I want, us to, I want to remind us, keep the receipt because God has put us in the place that when God is trying to teach us some stuff, Take your pen, pad, and paper with you so that you can take notes on that journey so that you can learn whatever the Lord is trying to teach you so that you don't have to repeat the same grade spiritually again. And beloved, some of us should have graduated from last year's stresses and strains. I remember trying to tell a young girl at the, my former pastor. She had always had tough times with boyfriends. She was, you know, a little younger going to school at, uh, up at, um, at, at one of the schools up in Montgomery. And I oftentimes told her daughter, uh, you're never going to find that right person if you keep attracting the same old people. She, she couldn't understand exactly what I was talking about. I said, you're going to keep repeating the same old no good people until you start taking your pen and your pad and you start taking inventory not of them but of yourself to help you understand why you keep choosing the same old no good Negroes. But because it's not their fault that they come to you, it's your fault for letting them in. I wish I had some. Some of us in here today can write a book on how to stay away from no good friends because the Lord has given us so many no good people in our lives that now we can teach others how to stay away from no good people simply because the Lord has sent us through a phase of, go, of, of coming in contact with no good people that now we understand and can teach others how to avoid those circumstances. What is there in your life today that the Lord allowed you to go through that now you can help somebody else with the same situation because the Lord has allowed you to go through some stuff? And if you are sitting here today and you have not learned anything in life that you can help somebody else with, then I would surmise that you wasted a good life. Because you've got to be able to help somebody while you're on life journey so that your living won't be in vain. Amen. Mothers and mother, you got to help somebody on this, help some young child understand that life ain't a crystal stairway. That there's a part of life that you got to push your way through. You got to struggle your way through. You got to praise your way through until something happens. But only you can tell them that because the Lord has allowed you to go through it. So I would, I, would, I would help us today to understand the importance of understanding the whole concept of the Lord's affliction. So when it is today, we zoom into the compass of this text, because that's enough psychology, let's deal with theology, then I'm out of here. So when it is, we zoom into the circumference of this text. In this part of this Psalm 119, we will see that God's word helps us to embrace and endure affliction. Help us to embrace and endure persecution all while affliction is happening. Because I want to remind us, in case I don't even get to finish this, little son, I want to remind us 
that when God afflicts us, well, watch this, the devil don't take a day off. Let me say that one more time. While the Lord is dealing with us, making us better and not bitter, that still don't keep Satan from coming trying to attack you. One thing I can say about Satan is he don't take days off. He does not use his vacation time. Every day Satan is going to and fro seeking whom he may devour. But beloved, today because God has allowed you to be in this place called sanctuary, that you will have a greater appreciation of what God is doing and you can minimize what Satan tries to do through persecution all because David says you can hold on to God's word. So when we zoom into the circumference of this text, this teaches us a few things. That our God, number one, hears our request for relief. Then number two, God sees the relentless persecution of the wicked. He sees it. And then number three, it teaches us something else. Number three, it teaches us that God provides relief when we yield to his word. Here it is today. And when we start looking at the discernment of affliction, number one, I think the very first thing this text is tailored to teach us is this. That you have to remain optimistic during affliction. Let me say that one more time since your mask hindered you from saying, talking back to me. You, you got to remain optimistic during affliction. When the Lord afflicts us, it helps us to get through affliction when we keep our heads up, our attitudes up, and our mind up. Because if you're going to make it through affliction, you got to remain optimistic through the situation, knowing that there's a greater appreciation on the other side than while you're in the middle of affliction. Amen. Let's look at verse 81. Verse 81 says it so very clearly. Verse 81 said, My soul fainted for your salvation, but I hope in your word. But my eyes fail from searching your word. David is looking for a word that will help him. And he's understanding that his eyes, watch his eyes, is failing him as he searched for a word saying, When will you comfort me? Question. He does not say, When will you get me out of this? He says, I don't mind staying in because in verse 71, he says, it was good for me that I was afflicted. But now in verse 81, he says, when will you comfort me? Which means David is saying, I'm not asking you to take me out of it. I'm just asking you to give me some comfort while I'm in it. Let me give you another translation. David is saying, please, Lord, be patient with me. He says, I'm not asking you to remove my stumbling box. I'm just asking you to give me the strength to climb. Lord, have mercy. Some of us are here today can take great pride in that. I'm not asking you to do something that's not right or that's illegal, God. I'm just asking you that while I'm in the middle of it, give me the strength to make it to the other side of it because I find value in going through affliction. And when mama can't tell you something, and daddy can't tell you something, and you won't listen to big mama because you think she too old, then God got a way. I wish I had somebody right there. That, that when you get too big for the folk around you, God got a way of getting you right back to where he wants you to be. And he's not doing it to harm you, he's doing it to help you. Lord, what kind of tragedy and trouble you would be in today if it wasn't for the Lord. What kind of accident or wrecks you would be in today if God did allow your car to start? What kind of tragedy and trouble you would be in today if the Lord had removed some people out of your life that you couldn't tell them that, that they weren't no good? Sometimes God has to do for you what you can't even do for yourself. Thomas gives a sense of desperation right here. He's desperate. Sense of desperation. His soul aches for God. His, his, 
not his, his soul aches for God. Uh, so many, so much that his soul aches for God that he says, I'm, 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 I'm about to faint waiting on God. No, 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 now you think that's some far-fetched thing. He didn't say his person is about to faint. That's when we're deprived of certain things and we fall out. But, 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 but David says, like David says, my soul is being deprived. So much that I'm about to faint. Why, why are you about to faint, David? I'm about to faint waiting on the Lord to show up. And some of you can't say nothing about that this morning. You've you, you never been there. But, but let me help you. Have, have you ever been in that place where you've been waiting on the Lord? And you've been waiting on the Lord? And, and you've sung that song, I don't mind waiting on the Lord. And the Lord don't show up. So you stop singing the song because... The song just infuriates and frustrates you even more, and, but you're still waiting on God. And just like Big Mama said, he don't come when we want him to come, but he always shows up right on time. The Lord shows up on time. It helps to help us to understand. He says he's fading, waiting on the Lord, and waiting on the Lord's salvation and redemption. Waiting on the Lord to save him from the struggles that he's going through. I don't want you to take me out. I'm just going to wait on you. But Lord, it's so hard waiting on you because if you've ever been there, when you're waiting on the Lord, the Lord don't answer questions. When you don't wait on the Lord, the Lord don't send you a beep or text or tweet saying, I'll be there in five minutes. The Lord just takes his hands off and it looks like he takes his good godly time getting there. And then the sisters are saying, since he ain't showed up yet, when he do show up, the sister said, we don't need you now. Lazarus is already dead. And then Jesus had to remind them, Lazarus ain't dead. He just sleep. And then that make you even mad because since your situation appears to be dead to you, when you do hear from Jesus, he coming with this off the wall stuff, talking about that situation ain't dead. It just give me room enough to give you material for a testimony and me some glory. It just looks dead to you. God works that situation out just like he said he would. It takes time. And the psalmist says, I'm about to faint waiting on God. But he got to be optimistic. And there's two terms he uses here. Two phrases are used to describe his dilemma. He says, number one, he says, my soul faints and my eyes fail. Look, look what's going on. My soul about to fall out. I'm about to faint. And I'm searching the scripture for your word. And while I'm searching the scripture, I can't find nothing to help me. And now my eyes getting tired. <laughs> but guess what? The whole time the Lord is growing him up. Teaching him how to wait on the Lord. Teaching him how to be of good courage while you wait. That's what we don't understand. That it's not enough to be complaining while waiting. But God wants us to, while we're waiting, have some joy. Have some cheerful moments. Have some anticipatory moments where we're saying, I'm just waiting on the Lord. He ain't showed up yet. If the problem is get, they've already started packing the truck up and taking stuff out. God hadn't showed up, but I'm still waiting, trusting, and believing that God's going to work everything out all right. He says, watch this. Both carry the eschatological idea of everything is coming to an end. That's it. Failing and fainting, coming to it. Fainting is the loss of strength. Failing is a collapse of strength. He's falling. He's fainting. The eyes are failing. They're collapsing. They're getting tired. Eyes are shut. Here is the psalmist. He feels like now that his soul and his eyes were weak and didn't feel like they could stand in the midst of affliction. He's, he's weak. But yet he's encouraged. His soul is faint. His eyes are failing. He, he feels weak and, and so empty. He's so empty of strength that they were unable to stand. His eyes can't stand. His soul can't stand. His spirit can't stand. He's in a place of weakness. He feels like his life is almost over. And, and, and he's not gotten to the last part of the scripture. He's still at the first part. Now he's rethinking his verse 71 
Uh, verse 71 said, it was good for me that I was afflicted. That's when he's teetering on the end of coming out. But just because he sees the house, he's not out of the woods. So, so David here now is saying, Lord, you need to hurry up. Maybe some of you have never been there with the Lord like I. Perhaps I'm the only one to be honest and say, sometimes I tell the Lord, now, Lord, Lord, I ain't asking you to open a Red Sea. I'm not asking you to, to, to make a lion my pillar. Lord, I just need you to get this bill paid. <laughs> Lord, you need to hurry up and, 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 and show up. Or, or, or maybe perhaps you're like me and you're just saying, Lord, if you don't show up now, I don't think I'm going to make it. Lord, you need to hurry up. And many of our lives we can testify that God really never shows up when we want him to, but we serve a sovereign God that always shows up right when we need him to. Watch this. Yet optimistic, optimistic, he has hope in God's word. Contrast. Since this weakness and fainting and failing, he found hope and strength in God's word. Hopeless, falling, strength is leaving, eyes are failing, but he finds hope in God's word. What, what, it appears David is, appears to be isolated. He does not speak in this text about someone encouraging him. He speaks about that when affliction comes, the Lord has a way of getting him to himself so that he can stop hearing from people and hearing from God. David says, he don't say anything about encourage yourself. David said, Lord, I need to talk to you. Because the only strength I can find comes from you, and I don't find the strength right now to understand what you're putting me through. But David says it very clearly. Here he finds hope in God's word. Strength comes from God's word. And beloved, I want us to understand today, and for those of you who are watching us via the word while well, don't just look at the Bible as a book full of inspirational things. No, it's the infatuate, it's the word of God. It's God himself breathed through the leaves of the pages, speaking to you, talking to you. God's word is just that important. But I see something else here. Not only do you have to remain optimistic during affliction, you also got to constantly fight pessimism during affliction. Maybe you didn't get that. You, you got to constantly, continually get negative people from around you when the Lord is dealing with you. Get negative things from around you when the Lord is dealing with you. Let me be honest just a little bit more. There's some type of music you can't even listen to when the Lord is dealing with you. Lord, have mercy. God will be telling you to hang in there, get everything. I'm encouraging you and I'm empowering you. And then you hear a song says, and God says, stay on in school, hang in there, get it together. Then you turn the radio and the song says, give it up, turn it loose. You got to be careful about what you're listening to when the Lord is dealing with you. Because when you are afflicted, you're looking for something to help you in the middle of your affliction. And if you're not careful, this pessimistic attitude will have you walking away from what the Lord told you you need to be in. Based on what you're listening to while you are going through what you are going through. And just because a peacock will fall from a tree and hit you in the head, don't start saying, that's the Lord talking to me. The Lord told me. No, that's just you're sitting under the wrong tree at the wrong time. You better stop taking things that are happening around you and thinking that's God. You better hear from God and God only to be sure that God is talking to you. That job wasn't for me because my car didn't start. You got a dead battery. You better talk to God and be sure what you're doing is God said, and not because of some circumstance that's happening around you. You just relate that to be God. You need to hear from God and not just because your car didn't start. Lord have mercy. That's, that you, you, you are an immature Christian when you're looking for signs and wonders. You, you need to talk to God and let God give you an answer. 
Well, what what'd you do, Pastor, when well, you ain't getting answers from God? Wait on the Lord. Be of good courage. And God will. Listen, you got to hear from God and not just because you flipped the light and it didn't come on. Oh, Lord, this, this is a sign from the Lord. That's just a sign that the lights didn't come on. Help us today. Look, 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 look at look at verse real quickly. Look at look look at verse number eighty three through eighty four. For I have become like a wine skin in smoke. Yet I don't forget your statutes. NIV. How many are the days of your servant? Lord, how long I got left in this thing? How many more days? Lord, listen, you know what David said. He's like us. Uh, it, it's like it's like when, when like my children when I done took their phone and did so. Uh, but how, how many more days I'm gonna be without it? <laughs> how, how many? Lord, how 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 long are you gonna let me stay in here? And then we go to the Lord. Lord, I done learned my lesson. <laughs> you know how we do, God. God, if you ever get me out of this, you ain't got never worry about me no more. So you ain't saying to me, let me help you. I'm gonna tell you about my own self. You, you know, when you're down on your knees and you're hugging that porcelain God, because that night you have drank both dog and clip. <laughs> and you're wrapped around that commode. And your stomach is in another world. And you're saying to the Lord, Lord, if you just get me, help me through this, if you just get me through, you ain't ever got to worry about me again doing this. And then, then the next weekend, you back at the club. Ordering the same old thing because the Lord gave you some relief. And that sounds facetious to many of us, and I said it to be facetious, but the real reality is that's just like us. Amen. We'll say to the Lord, Lord, I'm through with that. I'm through with this. I'm through with him. I'm through with her. J just until the next encounter comes. And you're right back doing the same thing you asked the Lord to deliver you from. Well, look, look at the text today. Say so you got to fight pessimism constantly. But, but watch this. But, but then the theological question comes: How do I fight pessimism during affliction? Let, let me give you a good, a good theological answer to this. How do you fight pessimism during affliction? When the Lord is working with you, how do you fight pessimism? That's a good question. I'm glad you asked. By appreciate, by ac accepting and appreciating your weakness, and trusting God's strength. All at the same time. By appreciating and accepting your weakness, all by looking at God's strength, accepting and appreciating God's strength, trusting God's strength in the, at the same time. Looking at yourself and seeing how deficient you are, and looking at God and seeing how efficient he is. All right. Amen. Looking at yourself and seeing how minor you are, but looking at God and seeing how major he is. Yes. Looking at yourself and seeing how human you are, and looking at God and seeing how divine he is. Yes. Th that's how you fight the this negativity, this, this optimism, when people try to tell you that this is why this is happening, Joe, this is why you're going through Joe, and Joe has done anything. Joe, you got to look at yourself and say, the same God that I'm getting mad at is the same God that made me. Yeah. Don't let God have to remind you when he, as he reminded Joe, where were you when I hung the stars in the sky? Yeah. While you hear waters puff out your chest, Job, and try to come at me? Where were you when I put the solar system in the world? Where were you when I stepped up without the use of a step ladder and painted the sky blue? Where were you when I reached back down and painted the ground green with flowers and daffodils and day? But where were you when I put wet in water? Where were you when I put the green in the grass? Where were you when I put the cool in the air? Where were you, Job, when all these things happened? Job couldn't answer the Lord because Job realized that he had made a mistake in questioning God about what God did. So well, you got to understand some stuff. God is good even when we don't think he is. Yeah. Watch, watch this. He says, a wine skin 
is what he appears to, to look like in the middle of smoke. Perhaps you can understand this by simply saying he feels useless, shriveled up, and unattractive because he's being blackened with soot. King James might say bottle, but the original translation says wineskin. He, he feels unappreciated. He feels like he's less and down to nothing. But despite his sense of weakness, he has determined to fight pessimism and not forget God's word. He is determined to walk with Jesus. Yes, he has. He's made up his mind that if I'm going to make it through this thing, not only do I have to be pessimistic, but I got to continually in my mind fight pesticism because, guess what, because the mind has a way of thinking all the wrong thoughts and you got to make the mind that you have be the same mind of Christ Jesus to get you through these circumstances because you can't think worldly and walk with a spiritual God. Amen. Weakness and negativity cannot make you forget God's word. Weakness and negativity can't make you forget God's word. You, you, just because you're in a weakened state, keep reading the word. You, while you're going through it, every once in a while, you need to hear, weep in May and do it for a night. The joy going to come in the morning. You need to hear, my hope is filled with nothing less. You, you need to hear God's word around you so that you don't start being so weak that it starts to bring you down. David said, what helped me in the midst of all of this? Reading the, the, the Lord's word. Well, let me help you out with something. Let, because there's a shift. And I, I don't want you to miss this. There's a shift in this text. That, that David thought that he could get God's attention by crying out to God about what others is doing to him. Uh, just, this, just this one scripture. David says like this. When will you execute judgment on those who persecute me? That's the question. Now, now, the next couple of scriptures, we're going to deal with something that's, but, but he says, Lord, help me. Don't, don't pull me out of this. Just give me strength. Lord, don't. and then the harder the, the situation gets, other starts to become a part of the problem. Let me help you out. Personal weakness and a sense of unfairness can lead us to become distracted and lose focus on God's word, trying to find others to blame for our own shortcomings. You're going through, the Lord is dealing with you, and now you're trying to get somebody else in trouble. Uh, you're trying to get somebody else in trouble, Lord, and the Lord is teaching David. I know you're going through. I'm the one who put you there. But you can't be distracted from my word. You just go back and read the word and focus on God's word. And you don't have to worry about those that are persecuting you. Because now you'll make an excuse and you're being distracted from the word by looking at somebody else and say, Lord, they're bothering me. Lord, they won't talk to me. Lord, she walked right by me and didn't speak. And the Lord said, get, stop worrying about Get back in my word so that you will know exactly what I'm trying to get you through. God said, I caused them not to speak to you because if they speak to you, then you'll start asking them questions. You'll want to hear what they got to say, and you need to hear me and my word. Stop worrying about them and put your focus back on me. Go on, teach, pastor. Too many of us, while we are afflicted and struggling through our, what God has placed us in, try to find fault in somebody else, and you don't know whether God is dealing with them or not. God is dealing with you through this little merry-go-round of life, and when the merry-go-round gets back where the Lord wants you to get off, then you can get off. But until then, stop pointing at everything else, because if you're on the merry-go-round and you're pointing at it now, in a few minutes, you done left them, and the Lord will take you all the way around just to get you back where he wants you to be. But, I, but 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 we, we've got to understand it. But I see one more thing because I got to get out of here. I see one more thing. 
not, not, not only do we today have to rem remain optimistic during affliction, and not only do we have to constantly fight pessimism during affliction, but one last thing and I'm out of here. You have to remember to let God be God in affliction. <laughs> you got to remember, you remember, you got to remember to let God be God in affliction. What, what, what do you mean, Pat? Well, I, I think it's, it's so eloquently put by David here in the chapter, verse 85 through 87. He says, the proud have dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. Why, why do we think people are going to follow the word of God when it comes to us? Why, why do we expect people going to do right, and then when they don't do right, we're upset? I can't believe, I can't believe they're not. That, that shouldn't surprise us no more. And I, I've seen it for myself. I hadn't seen a lot of that in my pastorship, in my growing in God, growing in grace. But God will put you in a place where his word will become true. You'll start seeing those that say they love God and do everything outside of what they say they love. And David says that, uh-uh, God. David said, that ain't right. These folks are, these folks are, 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 are the ones that are supposed to love you. They're not following your law. Saul is supposed to be the, the king, and Saul is trying to kill me all because you called me into this thing. And down there said, why should we continue to cry for Saul since that I've chose David? David is expecting Saul to act like a king. <laughs> we are expecting people in the church to act like the church is in them. <laughs> and the Lord is teaching David a good lesson right here. That, that, that if you're going to continue to trust me, I've got to show you who some people really are. You got to remember now, remember that, 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 that there's a discernment in affliction. God has to let you see some things while you've been afflicted so that you can learn. I told you, you better take your pen and paper with you. You better keep your receipt because you don't want to have to go buy this thing again. You've already been through enough trouble, been through enough hell, and you don't have to go through it again if you learn what God is trying to teach you right now. He says, Proud dug pits for me, which is not according to your law. That, Lord, you didn't tell that ain't your word for them to do that to me. Watch what he says. All your commandments are faithful. I like that. He came right back to it. Lord, they're digging ditches for me. But your word say that those ditches that they're digging ain't going to work. <laughs> and I'm going to hold on to that and not worry about the ditches. That, that, that's, that's what he said. Your commandments are faithful. They are, they are good. And he says, because they're, they're not just ditches, it's a pit. Yeah. Lord, have mercy. He said, they are, he said, they persecute me wrongfully. He, he said, Lord, they, 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 this ain't right. Th these are your people. Yeah. I've heard Moses say the same. Lord, why would your people do this to me? He, he understands that, that, that God is trying to teach him that, that, that you can't. And David says these words, Lord, please don't leave me in the hands of man. Amen. <laughs> man will love you today and wake up tomorrow morning hating you like you've done something. And it's not because God ain't good. Sometimes it's just digestion or a bad day or they feel like they gained a little weight or law, whatever. They get. People will hate you for no reason. It's not based on what you do to them. Watch what David says. David says, help me. Help me. Watch what he said. He said, because they almost made me end my life on earth. It, it'll do it. It, it, it. Listen, I ain't mad at David. It will stress you and frustrate you to the point where you just get sick and tired of being sick and tired. But David said, your commandments keep lifting me up. 
I'm down one minute. I go into my closet and I pull out that Bible and I come out with an S on my chest all because your word lifts me up. Lord, have mercy. David said, my life is like Cinderella. David said, I can, I can be the last one on the totem pole and your Holy Spirit can come on the inside of me just like Cinderella did. I can go to the dance with glass slippers on and be the queen of the whole show. But by the time the night ends, the devil could get so busy that I'm running away, leaving my glass slip on the step, trying to get back to my Bible, trying to get back to my word, and God is the only God I know that will send the prince to my house looking for me. Lord, help me. Lord, help me. All of us in here are supernatural man and woman. Superman is just one thing, superwoman, but we're a supernatural man, supernatural woman. Sometimes we don't have a closet to run to. It's thine word that I've hid in my heart that I might not sin against thee. And so since we're a supernatural man and supernatural woman, we don't have to strip off our clothes and come out with our costume on. We have it on the inside of us that we don't have to change that when problems come, we just step into what the Lord, Lord have mercy, what the Lord has already predetermined. Watch what he said. Remember to let God be God. The ideal is that they are undated like a wild animal. I'm finished. He says, it's, it's just not like digging a ditch because, you know, you can see the ditch. See what they do when they hunt wild animals, this is what they do. They dig a pit or in hole, put sticks on top of it, put leaves on top, make it look like it's solid ground, grass, sticks, leaves, and it makes it, they take great pride in making sure that the area looks the same. So when you come walking by, you're not going to say, oh, there's a ditch, I ain't going to walk, no, no, no. They make it look like it's, everything is fine. Lord, help us. And when they put the sticks and the grass and, and everything on it, here you come walking by. Well, watch this. Minding your own business. <laughs> doing what the Lord has called you to do. I'm finished. All I'm doing is walking. Talking to the Lord. And all of a sudden, you step on something and you hear a twig break. And when the twig breaks, all you know is you're going down. And, and you're in a place that, that now there is no way out and you are, you are caught. All because they, they, they are saying, David is saying because, you're caught because they want to destroy you and to get rid of you all in the process and you have to let God be God because just because God is dealing with you with affliction, that, that does not mean Satan is going to leave you alone. Let me close my Bible. And since God is dealing with you in affliction, Satan is digging a pit for you as well. Not only do you have to deal with God growing you up, but you also got to deal with Satan trying to bring you down. And sometimes we have to deal with both God growing us up and Satan pulling us down and we find ourselves being afflicted and being persecuted at the same time. Lord, have mercy. Lord, I, I got more sermon than this. I can preach right now, but I'm going to leave it alone. Satan gets in the picture. Now he's trying to bring you down. And here God is teaching us a lesson. What do you do when God is working on you and Satan joins the affliction? Lord, what do you do when God is trying to grow you up and Satan is trying to tear you down? 
David gives us a, good, a beautiful lesson. David prays this powerful, passionate, two-word prayer. Maybe some deacons ought to get this. You got to pray 15 minutes. Maybe this is a word for some deacons. Watch this. David says, help me. Lord, help mercy. The, the, two words. Help me. Oh, Father God, we pray to the God of the stratosphere, the hemisphere, and the atmosphere. Lord God, we pray that your divine word will enter into our fragile hearts. And Lord, when your divine word in our fragile hearts, God, we know that you have the power to reduce us to the level of which. Lord, help me. Help me. I'm finished. Sometimes two words is better than a 10-minute prayer service. Sometimes two words gets God's attention in the middle of affliction from God and persecution from the devil. If you can muster up the power to say, help me. God will step in right in the midst of time and get your back from against the wall and remind you if God be for you, that's more than the whole wide world against you. Lord, help me. Yes, sir. Hey, I didn't mean to go this far. I messed around here and got happy. And you, maybe you've never been in a hospital room. And the doctor said, we, we don't know what it is. It looks like cancer. And you just can't say, God, in the name of Jesus, we pray right now that you would touch whatever this, that. No, I ain't got time. Lord, help me. Hey. That child is sitting in the hospital, or that child is at the courthouse, or that child is about to go to the jailhouse, or that child is about to go to prison, and you don't know what's really going on, and you don't know what really to pray, and you just say, Lord, help me. And by that time, the doors fly open, the police say, he can go home with you. We find out who really robbed the place. It wasn't your son. It was somebody that looked like your, Lord, help me. And that will move God's hand and the needle start moving in your direction. And it's a blessing when the Lord just start leaning in your direction. When the Lord just start leaning in your direction. That means that the hands start to go in your favor and it looks like that you're going to be filled by the Lord and not empty from being around Satan. God just help me. When you ask the Lord to help you, the Lord will get it and just start throwing his weight around. God will start showing the devil how big and how bad he is. And when the Lord throw his weight around, God changes some stuff. God fix some stuff. God heals some stuff. God removes some stuff. Just let God be God and God will work it out all right. Hey, hey, I didn't mean to go that far, but you got to trust God and let God be God. You can't fix it. You'll just mess it up. You can't just take your hands off and your hands ain't big enough. Remove your hand from trying to grab it. Your arm ain't long enough. You just got to trust God. Let God be God. And you just go through it and come out on the other side. Thank you, Lord. Thank you, Lord. But Lord, what you going to do about this pit that I done fell in? Yeah. Well, there's a story. There's a story about a man who had fell in the pit. I'm finished. There's a story about a man who fell in the pit. He had fell in a pit. While he was in that pit, he, he started digging out little holes, put his hand in them. Digging out other little holes, put other hands in it. He dug little holes, put his foot and hands in it, and he found his way out of a pit. But just as the Lord would have it, his son fell in a pit. And so while his son had fallen into a pit, everybody ran back to the, to the, to the, to the camp. And they told the father, said, Father, your son has fallen in a pit. Our ropes are not long enough to get him. But he's fallen into a pit. The father said, well, where is he at? He said, he's five miles this way and seven miles over, and they gave him the direction. The father gets up, grabs his knapsack, and starts heading that way. Father gets to the place of the pit that they had dug for some wild beast or animal. And the son had went too far and fell and fallen in the pit. I'm finished. My time is up. So all of a sudden, the father gets to the pit, looks down in the pit. It's all dark down there. 
ropes won't reach. It's too deep. And all of a sudden, the father just jumped down in there. People of the village said, he's going mad. He loves his son so much that he'll rather die with his son than to see his son go through this. And all of a sudden, about 15 minutes later, there's a hand coming up out of the pit. <laughs> Another hand comes up out of the pit. And then the father comes in and turns around and puts his hand down, and the son is coming up out of the pit. And the village looked at the son, and that's what I want to tell you today, why the Lord allowed you to become afflicted. And the village said, what, what made you just jump down in the hole? Why, how did you know that you could get out of the hole? How did you? He said, because I've been down there before. Come here, because I don't want you to miss this. Don't you get upset because you've fallen in some pit. Don't you get upset because you've fallen in some trap or some scheme that the enemy set for you. You just went down there so that when someone else goes through that same set of circumstances, you can help them get out of the same pit you've fallen in because you've been there before. God wants us to understand that everything is not for void and everything is not for loss. It's for your understanding. You know what that old man did? He kept his receipts. While he was down there, he took some notes. Because he realized that if he didn't learn from the last time, there's no way he could help himself or anybody else. Come here, lean in real quickly. Some of the people that you're going to be able to help is going to be just like that story I just told you, someone close to you. It's going to fall into some bad times. And the only way you're going to tell them how to get out of it is because you've been in it yourself. Yeah. Doors of the church are open right down in the name of Jesus. Amen. Yeah. Doors of the church are open. The discernment of affliction. Lord, there's only some things you're going to be able to learn by going through some stuff. There's some stuff that you're going to be able to determine, discover, and, dis and discern, but you're only going to be able to do it in the middle of affliction. Doors of the church open today. Perhaps you are here. Uh, you're not here. You're on the World Wide Web. No matter where you are, doors of the church open. And you've been wondering why and understanding the purposes or don't understand some purposes, but the Lord have you here today. Could it be today that affliction is God's way of helping us discern what the Lord is telling us. Discern what the Lord's direction is for us to travel. Discern who is good or bad for us. Discern what the Lord is trying to teach us and show us. Those are the church open today. If you're watching via the World Wide Web, perhaps you are trying to decide whether you want to come to the Lord Jesus or not, we're going to put you in the hands of our praise team so that they could help help you get to a place where the Lord is pushing and motioning you to come forward. Perhaps after you hear a song of inclusion, a song of becoming a part of the body of Christ, Perhaps today you will say, I want to give my life to Jesus. I want to come to the Lord. I want to come to that place where the Lord can use me. I want to be able to know how to get out of a situation because the Lord has sent me through so much and I've learned from it. 